Yo, 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 DJ D-Lobeezy is back. Yeah, that's right, kids. Just when you thought it was safe to go back to the intertubes, guess who's shown up to rock and shock the place? That's right. All right. Enough of that. All right, kids. Uh, today, I want to continue our discussion of the late Middle Ages. That's chapter 12. Uh, to you ordinary folk. Uh, we need to talk about three topics today. We're going to talk about the Catholic Church and some of the uh, crises that it was undergoing. Uh, and then we're going to discuss a little bit about literature of the age and the use of vernacular and how modern, quote-unquote modern, literature was occurring or appearing for the first time. And then talk a little bit about uh, technology and medicine uh, and how uh, or what some of the more modern techniques were. Okay, so first we start. We've ta discussed already what the uh, reaction of the Catholic Church was to the bubonic plague, and it was pretty much crickets, at least from the top. Uh, not a lot of uh, mention, not a lot of interest in that because they were preoccupied with power, okay? When we look at the top ranking positions, these are called ecclesiastical positions. So starting with the office of the papacy, you've got the pope, uh, who is elected by cardinals. And down at the local diocese level, made up of several churches, you have a bishop who is in charge. Um, so this hierarchy uh, was composed almost... Um, entirely of lay people. Lay people are those that have not members of the cloth. They are not clergy members. They have not taken uh, those vows of celibacy and obedience uh, and sometimes also poverty. What these lay people have done have been, I guess, appointed to these positions because of their um, support, show of support to a king, to a monarch, and uh, this is a way of uh, rewarding them. Why would anyone want to be a bishop or a cardinal, you might ask, especially if they have to take certain vows? Well, they didn't. They were exempted from that. The reason why they were given these positions was because it certainly gave them power. It gave them prestige in the community, but it also gave them access to moolah. That's right, kids. 10% of your money is supposed to go to tithing. And when the kings at this time really didn't have a whole lot of money on hand from taxation, because, well, that would have been, uh, that would have required them to have power over the nobility, and many kings at this time did not. So they did have power over the church. Well, at least they attempted to exercise power over the church by uh, electing these um, high ranking ecclesiastical or, or appointing these positions to. Uh, supporters, political supporters, okay? So you can see how there was a great deal of um, preoccupation on power and uh, not so much on the uh, spiritual nature of the job. Okay, so we're going to begin our talk taking a look at what's happening uh, between a pope uh, in Rome, Pope Boniface the Eighth, and one of our um, kings that we've already talked about, uh, King... Uh, Philip the Fourth or King Philip uh, the Fair. Where have you heard that name before? Well, he's the first monarch of the Valois dynasty that has uh, taken the throne inside of France uh, to solve the crisis of secession that has uh, occurred in England, right? Okay, so... As I said, the reason why they didn't want an Englishman on the crown was because there was long-standing war. Okay, well, one of the things that Philip uh, has to deal with is lack of fundage, money. And so he begins taxing the nobility, now excuse me, the, um, the church for, uh, for those needed funds. And so the Pope in Rome uh, calls foul, says you can't do that. And this begins the uh, quarrel between the two, between the King of France and the Pope in Rome. Um, this initially, uh, the Pope attempts to make it appear as if he's really more concerned about warfare. So he issues a papal bull 
That's right, kids. A papal bull is a document uh, issued by the papacy that would be the equivalent of an executive order, okay, coming from a king, I mean a president. So he issues a papal bull called Clericos Lacos, which prohibited uh, the taxation of the clergy without papal approval without papal approval. He passed that or issued that because he said he claimed he was attempting to try to reduce warfare between European neighbors. Uh, the true or the more, more accurate reason would be because he was attempting to uh, hold on to his power, okay, and the money that went along with it. So the this is ignored um, by not only the uh, Pope in France, but also uh, the Pope in England, or not the Pope in France, the King in France and the King in England. Uh, so this leads the Pope uh, to double down, and he is forced to pass or issue yet another papal bull. This one's called Unum Sanctum, and this is in 1302. And essentially, uh, it is a document that states that there is only one true church, and that's the Catholic Church, and there is only one salvation, and it is through the church. And that since there is only one true church, one course of salvation, one God, there is but only one voice allowed to speak for uh, the for God, and that is the Pope. And if you go back and look for some biblical support, you see Simon Peter being appointed by Jesus as what many would consider the first Pope. Peter, you are. Peter, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. Okay, So that gave the legitimacy to the papacy, and he does take some liberties in stating that the power of kings or temporal power is subordinate to that of spiritual power, which was the Catholic Church. So that is an incredible amount of power. Um, he issues this uh, papal bull, which is a big deal, um, but it's really not taken very seriously as a credible threat by the king of France, who's known as Philip the Fair. We could call him Philip the Fierce, because what Philip does is respond by sending his uh, agents or his posse to go down to Rome and rough up the Pope, and they do just that. They kidnap him, and ultimately he dies at their hand. The result of this is that he's so, the, the king of France so frightens the papists or the the ensuing popes that they take up residence in Avignon, France. So this is a period, a uh, seventy three year period from thirteen oh five to thirteen seventy eight, known as the Babylonian Captivity. Okay. Uh, this re that is a old biblical term referring to the Jews um, being enslaved by the Babylonians. But it has a modern, more modern meaning here. Babylonian captivity, captivity when the papacy is more or less held hostage by the uh, by the king of France. Okay, in 1377 we get a new pope. He decides to move it back to Rome. Following his death, the cardinals who elect the pope uh, appoint uh, a new pope in Rome, an Italian pope, Pope Urban VI. Uh, the French bristle at this. They don't like the fact that now they have an Italian pope, so they got used to having the papacy there in Avignon, France, so the French cardinals appoint their own. So now we have two popes who have simultaneously excommunicated one another uh, and declared each other the Antichrist, as I said in class. I'm used to being called the Antichrist, but a lot of people aren't. So when called the Antichrist, that's a big deal. The uh, effect of which uh, goes to limit or, I guess, um, lessen the power and the prestige of the Catholic Church by, uh, by, by the devoted uh, Catholic following. And so when they see the squabble, this very public squabble, where each is calling each other a fraud and the Antichrist, people can't help but stop and you know, watch and gander and, and begin to question whether or not there's some validity to that and just that drama uh, of the whole situation tends to leave a bad taste in people's mouth and this is not something that a religious organization should be involved in all right so this is kind of the great the beginning of the problem 
uh, for the Catholic Church, and this is known as the Great Schism, all right, or split, uh, four decades where there are two popes. Uh, it is There's an attempt to resolve this at the Council of Pisa in 1409, where this council uh, basically it forces the abdication of the previous two popes uh, and then appointed a new pope. Well, the, the two deposed popes refused to abdicate uh, the papacy, and they maintain, uh, and now we have a third pope. And so instead of two antichrists, we have three. All right, this continues, uh, and then in 1418, they uh, are actually 1417, the Council of Constance elects, a th I guess, a new pope. And finally, the problem is resolved. But the damage has been done, the reputation of the Catholic Church has been wounded, and it's going to take, um, well, unfortunately for the Catholic Church, it doesn't recognize uh, the folly of its ways, and it, it's going to continue for another century before something really, really big gets its attention. And that is in the name and shape of Martin Luther. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, just to be clear. Okay, so what this is going to uh, lead to uh, will, will be continued, or I guess a beginning of people who are publicly critical of the Catholic Church. And it's not going to be members of the clergy, which typically it, it had been up until this point. People that were uh, critical of the Catholic Church were typically clerics or clergy members. Well, now, since we have um, a growing middle class, uh, the growth of trade, we have increased education or access to education. So this uh, growing middle class is also educating its young, and therefore these people know how to read the Bible, understand scriptures, and are finding some discrepancies with the practices of the Catholic Church. And they are going to be dealt with uh, by being declared heretics. But this is a unique problem because, as I said, these people are not members of the clergy. Okay, the first is an Italian lawyer uh, and um, a uh, university uh, scholar whose name is Marsiglio of Padua. Um, and he's early on, and he wrote a book called Defensor Passis, uh, Defender of the Peace, which was, I guess, his um, criticism of the Catholic Church and the idea that ultimate authority, spiritual authority, whether you know, whether you believe in temporal authority being subordinate to spiritual authority, the problem remains that's way too much power to be in the hands of one person. So, first off, he identifies this notion that there should be a concept that we understand today as separation of church and state. All right, So, there are two swords, as the uh, study guide suggests, and they are equal to one another. Well, in fact, the temporal should probably be, uh, should supersede uh, the spiritual. So he goes the opposite direction, all right? And also, he really doesn't like the idea of so much authority being invested in the hands of one man uh, who is fallible, who is human. Even if he is the vicar of Christ, he is a human, and he is capable of, well, he's flawed, as all men are, okay? The... Um, movement that he leads or I guess calls for is the idea that um, doctrinal issues, uh, those things con uh, concerning dogma, um, should be, those decisions should be made up of a council, a general council. There's still a pope, but um, there's also a council made up of other uh, biblical scholars and lay people who carry the same weight in decision making. All right, and so this is to kind of check the the power of uh, what could be potentially a corrupt pope. Um, he is dealt with uh, by being declared a heretic. Um, some people, after he is silenced, take up the cause, and they become known as conciliarists, okay, the root word being council here. So they are people who believed that uh, the pope's power should be shared with a general council, okay? Um Moving forward, um, as I mentioned, the importance of lay people in this chapter uh, is is growing. 
um, and th their influence is due to the fact that their numbers are growing and their level of education is going up. And because there seems to be a vacuum here, as far as a spiritual vacuum is concerned, the Catholic Church, the leadership of the Catholic Church is distracted and it is absent on these spiritual matters. And it, there, I mean, there's no wonder because... Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, these ecclesiastical positions are occupied by people who are lay people. So, I mean, obviously there's, there's not going to be the kind of spiritual leadership that the people so desire. So um, people kind of take it upon themselves to fill the void, okay? And we see uh, a person by the name of Thomas Akempis uh, who writes a book known as The Imitation of Christ, who discusses it discusses the importance of living a very simple and christ-like uh, uh, existence one that is devoted to the reading of scriptures and um, a life of uh, piety um, simple devotion to christ and there were a number of people uh, who agreed with him and they created a kind of a lay order, if you will, and they were known as the Brethren of the Common Life, but they were not clergy members because they were not recognized um, by the uh, Catholic Church as being a order of any type. The uh, Brethren, uh, as I mentioned, talked about the importance of scriptures, so that's important. Uh, women um, were similar in that they had concerns, um, smaller in number because the number of women that were educated at this time was very small, but they were still there. And um, for many, uh, the importance of uh, a religious life centered around the Eucharist and the importance the Eucharist played. Uh, Catholic Church views the Eucharist as a very important sacrament, probably the most important sacrament where Jesus at the Last Supper shares a meal with his disciples and instructs them to do this in memory of him. The uh, meaning of that has been uh, extrapolated into that he wants the Eucharist to be celebrated at religious services, and that is what is done. Uh, Catholics believe that there is a miracle that takes place uh, on the altar by the priest called transubstantiation, in which ordinary bread and wine is changed miraculously into the real substance of Christ. Okay, uh, This is a controversial topic today, as it was back then. Um, the uh, Eucharist, though, has been very important to several people, including Joan of Arc, who drew spiritual strength from it. Uh, when we look at the trial of Joan of Arc, she was refused Catholic privileges, which meant she was not allowed to receive the Eucharist. And over her 10-week trial, this proved to weaken her spiritually, so much so, as mentioned in the last lecture, that she eventually signed um, a declaration stating that she, in fact, did not hear voices. When sentenced to death, they finally relented and gave her the Eucharist or allowed her to receive the Eucharist. She drew strength from that and then re came back and said she had, in fact, uh, heard voices. Uh, so defiant to the end. Um, the woman that we want to mention is Catherine of Siena, who lived a very um, pious and devoted life and a very simple life. One which we could even describe as ascetic, meaning removing all worldly pleasures or all personal uh, belongings. And the idea there is that the passageway into heaven is narrow. And that if we allow ourselves to become consumed or distracted by material goods, we're going to have a difficult time fitting into uh, heaven okay and so that was central to her message but also the importance of the eucharist so we cannot forget that that among many lay people was important 
Another early reformer or critic of the church was an Englishman, John Wycliffe, who was uh, educated at Oxford University and was well educated on the, uh, the Bible, uh, insisted that the scriptures should be central to the teachings of the Catholic Church. Duh. Uh, saw it as so important that he translated the uh, Bible into English or the New Testament. At any rate, um, he was someone who was critical of the authority of the papacy, similar to that of Marsiglio Padua, but he was also very critical of the uh, Eucharist and the idea of transubstantiation. Um, he was furthermore troubled by the fact that a, uh, a priest who may in fact be sinful um, or have grave or serious sin on his soul, does he really have the power to miraculously change bread and wine into the blood and uh, the body and blood of Christ. Uh, so um, he is excommunicated and threatened with uh, death and uh, being burned at the stake. But because of his popularity among the nobility, uh, because he basically challenges the Catholic Church's authority to take money from churches. And so this is something that the nobility likes the idea of keeping wealth inside of England and not sending it to Rome. So he's got it's 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 good to have friends in high places. Um, and then after he passes, he has a number of followers who have the name Lollards. Not really sure about where that comes from, but they also preached in the vernacular, which breaks from the tradition of uh, everything in church services being in uh, Latin. So teaching in the vernacular is a new trend.